Okay, prep your headphones, your car stereo, or your Bluetooth speaker. Today on the show, we have Will Shorts, the editor of the New York Times Crossword. So, of course, we're giving you a made-for-weird-work puzzle. What do you take me for? Okay, here it goes. Take the word elation, E-L-A-T-I-O-N. Rearrange those seven letters to name part of the human body. Sounds easy. It's only seven letters, but very few people get it. If you've wanted yet feared to do work that is weird, this is the show you just need to hear. Did you figure it out? All right. All I can tell you is the answer's hidden somewhere in this podcast episode. So if you're looking to alleviate that curious case of head scratching, you're just going to have to listen to the show. Today, Will and I dig into the 75-year history of the New York Times crossword puzzle. From its start as a distraction for readers in the wake of the bombing of Pearl Harbor to, well, the welcome distraction from the news cycle of today. And Will breaks down how for the last 25 years, he edits seven puzzles a week, each day increasing in difficulty. Here's a hint. The story involves an Arabian horse farm, a -a one-of-a-kind college degree, and a crack team of whip-smart puzzle heads. I'm Sam Balter, and this is Weird Work. Now let's listen to them speak about their jobs, which are quite unique. Weird work. First question. Uh, I know you're a bit of a puzzle history buff. So do you know what is the oldest known crossword? You would think crosswords go back to ancient times, but actually they're a 20th century American invention. The first one appeared in the New York World, an old newspaper, on December 21, 1913. And it appeared in the Sunday section called Fun. It was uh, about 8 by 10 inches, 12 to 16 pages each Sunday. And on the Sunday before Christmas in 1913, the editor of that section, Arthur Wynn, put in a puzzle he called a word cross. And this was mixed among among jokes and riddles and other kinds of puzzles and advertising. And it was an immediate hit with the readers. It became a weekly feature in the world. And uh, the puzzle sort of struggled along. Just a few people knew it by the 1920s, but not many. In 1924, two young graduates from Columbia Journalism School, Dick Simon and Max Schuster, were starting a publishing firm. They looking around for ideas for books to publish. Um, Dick's aunt Wixie was a big fan of the crosswords in the world and suggested they do a book of crosswords. They looked around, found there was no such thing. So they went to the New York world, went to their offices, and the editors there, the crossword editors, the puzzle editors, pulled out, opened a drawer of unpublished manuscripts from readers, pulled out 75 of them, um, the book was, uh, was collected in the book, published in April 1924, and became, well, uh, a sensation. The first printing of 3,500 copies sold out immediately, then they did another 3,500, and then 5,000, 7,500, So this was, a, this was a big-time book. People were very excited when they got to have the opportunity to have, like, a lot of puzzles to solve. Yeah, and it uh, it started a craze. By the end of the year, Simon & Schuster's, uh, they had put out three crossword books by that point, and they ranked number one, two, and three on the national nonfiction bestseller list, and uh, started a craze, just like, you know, the Macarena, or Pet Rocks, or Rubik's Cube, you name it. It was bigger than all those put together. <laughs> That's that's awesome. And I have one one quick question. You mentioned that the first puzzle was in the fun section with a lot of like jokes and riddles and things like that. Do you know if it was the same people writing the jokes that were also working on the puzzle? Interesting. Well, I don't know that it's known who created the things. I assume that it was Arthur Wynn, the editor of the section, who made up most of the stuff in the section. Yeah, I just think because puzzles of, especially the crosswords, have always had this kind of like sly, funny humor to them. And I wonder if that's always yeah. kind of been baked in since the beginning. There is something that connects puzzles with humor and vice versa, I guess, because they're, they're both playful. Uh, they twist the brain. They're creative. 
for some reason, they go together. <laughs> so the crossword at the New York Times is absolutely infamous, but it wasn't really kind of always that way. I'm wondering, like, what are some of the reasons people at the New York Times might have resisted having the crossword in it? Well, the New York Times always set itself apart from other papers by being sober-minded. Uh, in 1924, during the crossword craze, they actually published an editorial decrying the popularity of crosswords, calling it an infantile pastime that was going to, uh, the fad was going to disappear along with flagpole sitting and mahjong. Um, but they were wrong. The craze died in 1925, but the puzzle lived on. There was a, there was a, a, a lot of people, smaller number than the craze, but a lot of people wanted crosswords. And well, virtually every newspaper in, in America started a crossword in 1924, 25, in that period. The New York Times held out until 1942 at the start of World War II, and it was thought that crossword would be a way to divert readers' attention from the, the terrible news, the sad news, the hard news of the war. And the story goes that the publisher of the Times then, Arthur Salzberger, was tired of buying the competing Herald Tribune to get their crossword and decided it was high time the time start its own. And they had the good sense to ask Margaret Farrer, who was co-editor of, the first, of, of all the crossword books up to then, they had the good sense to ask her to be the crossword editor. And she, um, her goal was to set the puzzle apart from all the other crosswords in the country by a higher level of quality and, well, I guess more intellectual rigorousness, more literary references, um, and just a higher quality puzzle. And within a year or so of the start of the Times crossword, it was, I think, already the uh, the best and most famous. So finally, during kind of World War II, you have this country that's very afraid, and the New York Times is like, okay, now we can have a little bit of fun and distraction. <laughs> <laughs> right, and yet... <laughs> One across in that first crossword was, I think the clue was famous one-eyed general, and the answer was Wavell, W-A-V-E-L-L. He was a general, American general in World War II, and the puzzles were filled with news references, because even if the Times had a crossword, you know, they wanted it to be a serious one. So there were lots of references to the, to the news. Uh, Margaret's feeling was, it's better for the crossword to divert people rather than tie in with uh, the hard things of life. So uh, she said while the editors while the, you know while the editors at the times weren't looking, she started using more literary themes and having fewer news references. And eventually, um, I mean you you know the crossword should be relevant to modern life, but it should also be diverting as a way to get away from the harsher aspects of life and she directed the crossword that way. Do you think that that sort of trend has continued where from when the puzzle first started to now, it's both supposed to be relevant and distracting? Yes, that's a good way to put it. I'd like the crossword, the New Times crossword, to feel like it's part of today's life. You know, it should reflect life and culture, but avoid the harsher aspects. There are words that appear in the newspaper that I won't put in the crossword. Like what? Well, take the word penis, for example. You know, I think within the last few years, the word penis has come up in news stories because it's relevant. There's no way to sanitize that. And yet people don't want the word penis in their crossword. <laughs> so you have, you have like a blacklist of words that you're like, it's not making it into the crossword. Nobody even a, bother coming yeah. to me with this word. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I have never allowed the word urine in the crossword. And, you know, I'm sure that's been in the paper for good reason now and then. But we don't need that in our crossword. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about, like, when was the first time that you remember coming in contact with the New York Times crossword? Well, that's interesting. I grew up on an Arabian horse farm in Indiana my parents subscribed to the local hometown paper and the Chicago Tribune. Um, but I really wasn't aware of the Times Crossword. That was a faraway thing. 
if I thought about it at all, I thought, well, that is some foreign thing that I would never relate to. Never, well, I would never be part of that. But uh, I love puzzles, so I was a puzzle head right from a very young age. What What do you mean by that? You were a puzzle head. I mean, I bought puzzle books, and I started making puzzles when I was eight or nine. By the early teens, I was creating writing a puzzle book. I sold my first puzzle professionally when I was 14, became a contributor to Dell Puzzle Magazines when I was 16, and uh, uh, when I was in the eighth grade, asked to write a paper on what I wanted to do with my life, I wanted to be a professional puzzle maker. So you have been like puzzle obsessed since being a child? Yes, and <laughs> I don't know why. No one else in my family did puzzles. They were something I picked up on my own. I think I owe it partly to my mom because she was a writer, and we, I got my love of words from her, I think. Um, and she showed me how to, since she had stories and articles published, she showed me how to submit my work for publication. So uh, I owe a lot to her. So, but no one in your family was like really into puzzles. You just came in contact with them and just wanted more and more puzzles to solve. Yeah, and more and more puzzles to make. And isn't that odd? I've, uh, I keep marveling at how everyone is different, you know? And um, I remember um, my brother buying me a chemistry set for Christmas once. My older brother bought me a chemistry set. And, you know, you mix some chemicals together and they change color or some smoke comes up. I did that for a day or two and then set it aside. Just didn't interest me. <laughs> remember, uh, my mother borrowed, uh, I listened to music a lot in the radio, liked, uh, you know, I liked rock and roll. And my mom uh, borrowed a guitar from a neighbor, set it on the bunk bed above mine. It sat there for nine months when I never touched it, and she took it back. You know, some things just naturally resonate with you. Those things didn't, but <laughs> puzzles did. And uh, I knew from a uh, very young that I wanted to be a professional puzzle maker. I thought that meant, uh, and, and puzzles don't, uh, when you sell puzzles to publications, you don't make a lot of money. How, like how much how much is like one puzzle? Well, the first one I sold made seven dollars and fifty cents. Uh, nowadays, uh, the Times pays decent rates. We pay uh, up to four hundred fifty dollars for a, a, a daily puzzle weekday and a thousand to twelve hundred dollars for a Sunday, which is not bad. Other places pay less, but uh, it's very, even that it's very hard to make your living at that. I imagine myself living in an attic somewhere. You know, turning out my little puzzles for fifteen dollars in each, fifteen dollars each, and uh, I would have been happy because I'd be doing what I wanted. Okay, you you are puzzle obsessed. You have the dream of becoming a professional puzzler. What did you go to school and study? So I went. I grew up in Indiana. I went to Indiana University, and I'm very lucky to have done that because. They had a new program then, just started, called the Individualized Major Program. And if you're accepted, you can major in anything you want. I started out in economics, but uh, when I found out about this program, I decided to change my major to enigmatology, the study of puzzles. Uh, I remember going into the, uh, the program's office and telling them I wanted to do this. And uh, they were skeptical, but... Uh, they could see how serious I was about this. You can guess Indiana had no courses on puzzles, so I made them all up myself, and everything was individual study with professors who would work with me. For example, one course was on crossword construction, and every couple of weeks, I would go into my professor's office with a new crossword I'd made, sat next to him while he tested it and critiqued it, and that's how I made my first you know, quality crosswords. Uh, I took a course on the psychology of puzzles through a professor in the psychology department, and the, that was partly what is what goes on in the brain when we're solving a puzzle, and also why do we do puzzles? You know, there's no real reason to, but we enjoy it. Why do we enjoy it? So I studied all that, and my thesis was on the history of American word puzzles before 1860. For that, I went to Indiana University as a, a great library. Uh, I went through all their 
everything they have, including microform and microfiche, looking through all the American publications up to 1860, searching for puzzle columns and puzzles. So I think I know more about the history of puzzles than anyone else in the world. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know anybody who's coming close to you on this. And, and just as a quick question, you mentioned that you took these courses. Are there other people in these courses or is it just you for the most part? Oh, like- it's just me. It's just me. <laughs> There's lots of unusual majors, but uh, I'm the only one in the world ever – to get a de- ever to have a, a degree in enigmatology. You are the only one. No one else has followed suit in having an enigmatology degree. No, and when you think about it, why would you do that? <laughs> when you graduate, it's not as if there's a job waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> there's probably some other young Will Shorts like figure out there now, though. You know, maybe in like Germany or Japan or something like that, just <laughs> jones in to solve more puzzles. Yeah, well, every once in a while, someone writes me, some creative person who loves puzzles writes me, say they'd like to get this, uh, get a, a degree in enigmatology too, so I give them some suggestions, but no one ever follows up. <laughs> Still just me. So, okay, so you go and you become the, it sounds like basically the world expert on puzzles and the only holder of an enigmatology degree. Then you can you talk to me a little bit about when you got hired at the New York Times and taking over as the editor for the crossword? Right. Well, I was 35 years younger than my predecessor. So, of course, I was going to bring a fresher, younger approach. I was the youngest crossword editor in the Times' history. Huh. Um, I think I was chosen partly so I could bridge the generations. Most of the contributors uh, under my predecessor, especially toward the end, were older people. I'd say the average age was somewhere in the 50s in the contributors. And uh, I was friends with the older contributors, but uh, I also knew the younger generation. So I wanted, I want, I wanted, and I want the crossword to reflect the lives and interests and culture of everyone who reads the newspaper and who solves the puzzle. So, uh, I started bringing in younger contributors, obviously. I think I have a, a playful mind, and so I wanted the themes to be more playful, wanted more humor and the more twists in the clues and themes, and uh, more, uh, I guess, a more less crossword ease, less stupid obscurity, and have <laughs> the puzzles reflect more of real life. So you wanted it to be a little bit more broadly appealing and potentially broadly more accessible to people. Would you say that's... That's right. Yeah. yeah. And the crossword is never going to be hip, I don't think. <laughs> Not trying no? to make it hip. You don't but, think it uh, could be... I don't know. I, th- I know lots of hip people who, who go <laughs> on the crossword. <laughs> Oh, I think hip, hip people can do it, but the crossword itself is not hip. You know, we have to be honest. But I want the, I want the puzzle to be relevant. So the puzzle's got to, it's got to be relevant. And one of your early contributions was bringing in a lot of younger editors and younger contributors. Yeah. Uh, and that's happened, in, I think, in the whole history of the Times crossword up to me. I think there were five or six known teenagers to have been published. And just in my years, we've had almost 40, I think. Uh, And I've published the youngest uh, crossword contributor ever, 13 years. And uh, there's just, uh, it's really, I think the average age of of the published puzzle makers now is in the 30s. And we, uh, well, I, as I say, I published a contributor as young as 13 and published one as old as 101. Well, uh, it's uh, the whole range of people who read the Times and solve puzzles. Bringing in a younger audience or a younger group of contributors, did that cause any tension with kind of the old guard when you took over? Yes, and it wasn't just the young contributors. I had... Uh, ticked off a lot of solvers. I, the onslaught of mail I got at the start from people who loved what I was doing and hated what I was doing, uh, it was almost overwhelming. What was the hate mail about? Well, first of all, there wasn't much current culture in the crossword uh, at the time I took over. And as 
the uh, editor of the New York Times magazine then put it, he said if there was any reference to something in the crossword that had happened within the previous 25 years, it came as a shock. Like, what was that? What's that doing? Um, and I thought the crossword, you know, should reflect life. So, of course, there would be modern references, including TV, movies, sports, rock and roll. Everything should appear in the puzzle. And I'm not filling the puzzle with that. There is plenty of older culture, too, and lots of things that, you know, are just timeless. But that, I thought, should be part of the puzzle. And uh, some people didn't think that, uh, you know, those aspects of life should be in a puzzle, partly because they just didn't know them, so they felt left out. Uh, um, and my feeling was, you know, if you cut off part of life, don't expect the world not to move along without you. So uh, the crossword, I think, should have everything. Also, I thought the, the crossword, I, there's a, I think there's more humor and twists in the clues and the themes than there were before. And some people's minds are just kind of straightforward, you know. They don't like twists. Something that uh, confused me for a long time, people wrote in some, on the very same puzzle. They say, your puzzles are harder than they have ever been before, and others are saying your puzzles are easier than they are, were before. <laughs> and I thought, how can this be? You know, it's either it's one or the other. And then I figured out it was my style of puzzle was affecting people huh. in different ways. And if you have a playful mind that uh, likes twists, yeah. my puzzles probably were easier than they were before. And if your mind doesn't work that way, then the puzzles were harder. So your puzzles, if I'm getting a sense of like your style, whereas the puzzles before were like, do you know this esoteric literary reference or, you know, this like cultural thing from a while ago, yours were more like tricky questions that if you could – that most people would be able to get if they could unravel what the question was about. But other puzzles yeah. were more like, do you even know this play <laughs> from the 19th century, you know, like 18th century or something along those lines? Right. And it's not so much <laughs> testing knowledge like that as vocabulary, you know, words from the depths of the unabridged dictionary that you never encounter in life. Um, uh, and you know, once in a while words like that are necessary just to complete a corner or something, but generally speaking, I want the vocabulary of crosswords to reflect the words that we use in life that we use and that we read. Uh, and here's just a stupid little example. Yeah. The word, uh, um, well, my predecessors didn't allow commercial names in the crossword. And if the word Oreo, O-R-E-O -E appeared in the puzzle, the clue invariably was, mountain colon combining form, which means a prefix. You know, O-R-E-O -E is, uh, if you were, the word oreogenesis means the creation of mountains. So Oreo was always clued in the sense of mountain. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, how many people know that? And we all know it is the cookie. You know, it's America's <laughs> favorite cookie, they say. So that's how it's been clued ever since. <laughs> Even just, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I... Your puzzles drive me insane. I <laughs> <laughs> literally have never been able to finish a Sunday crossword. I always just end up frustrated and upset. Oh, man. Uh, and even just hearing that one puzzle, that one question, I was like, are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> <laughs> so I do wonder, like, in your mind, like, is there – is there like a favorite crossword or a favorite clue to you that like epitomizes a great puzzle? Wow. Well, it's hard to say one thing. I've put out three collections of my favorite crosswords, two of them, the weekday puzzles and one, my uh, favorite Sunday crosswords. I think my all time favorite crossword, and I've said this before, it appeared on election day in 1996. I don't know if you know about this puzzle, but it appeared on election day, Tuesday. Uh, it was by a puzzle maker in Indianapolis, uh, Jeremiah Farrell. And it appeared to predict the results of that day's presidential election. The clue for the middle answer across the diagram was headline in tomorrow's newspaper. And this was the year, if you remember, Bill Clinton and Bob Dole running for president. And the answer could be Clinton elected. But it also could have been Bob Dole elected. Either one worked with the crossings. For example, the first down answer across that was black Halloween animal. And the answer could be cat forming the sea of Clinton or bat 
performing the first B of Bob Dole. And the next down was French 101 word. It could be Louis, L-U-I, meaning him, or it could be Hui, O-U-I, meaning yes. And each of the succeeding answers, clues and answers, uh, did double duty. And no matter what happened in that day's election, the puzzle was correct. Well, uh, that uh, the puzzle appeared that, uh, while people were voting during the day. Most solvers filled in Clinton elected because <laughs> the, cause he was ahead in the polls. It looked like he was going to win. And they thought uh, we were being – the Times was being presumptuous or maybe showing its liberal bias by assuming Clinton would win. And then there were people who filled in Bob Dole elected and thought we'd made a big mistake. <laughs> so that I, – that, that, okay, I get – that gives me a really good sense of like what makes it. One, it's confusing. Like for <laughs> you – like it's tricky that it could be both ways and answer both ways. It's incredibly culturally relevant. Um, and it's like timely and literally involves something that's happening that day. (laughs) Right. It hasn't even (laughs) happened yet. (laughs) It hasn't even happened yet. Like it is happening as the puzzle is going out. Like that, that seems like if I think about what you've told me about your predecessors, like that would be unheard of to do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you a little something. Jeremiah Farrell submitted a crossword to Maleska in 1980 when Reagan and Carter were running for president. And he had done the puzzle in which one across could be either Carter or Reagan, and they each worked with the crossings down. And uh, Maleska rejected the puzzle. Um, And so Jerry sent it to me at Games Magazine, where I was at the time. He sent it to me like in September, something like that. And it was uh, because of the magazine schedule, it was impossible for me uh, to schedule the puzzle before the election. But I wrote Jerry that I love this puzzle. That's a fantastic idea. Unfortunately, I can't run it. Well, 16 years later, he remembered <laughs> how much I liked that puzzle in 1980, and he made a much better version of the idea in 1996. That's, oh my God, that's so funny that it's like years later, he's like, Will Shorts is going to love this puzzle. <laughs> he's like, I know he will be excited about this one. And I can finally get this like genius puzzle idea into the paper. <laughs> that's right. One of the things I'm wondering is when a crossword lands at your desk, what does it look like? Like, is it, puzzle, is it, yeah. is it uh, blank? Do you have to solve it? Or, oh God, no. <laughs> No, no, no. I, well, I get 75 to 100 submissions a week. Okay. So if I had to solve every one of those, that would be I, – I, I couldn't even solve that many puzzles. Never mind get any work done. No, uh, people – anyone is welcome to s- submit a puzzle for consideration. And if anyone wants to try, they can go to cruciverb.com, which is C-R-U-C-I-V-E-R-B.com. And there's some links on the left about ha- how to submit puzzles, and uh, not only to the New York Times but elsewhere. So uh, the puzzles come in on by paper because uh, it's just actually easier for me to deal with paper submissions. Um, hmm. Everybody gets an answer. The biggest part of the job actually is answering the mail. In uh, When I started the Times, it was just me. I looked at every single submission myself wow. and uh, replied to everybody, at least a yes or no. And I always tried to say something about the puzzle, too. So if they continue to contribute, they uh, can uh, get something more to my taste next time. That's actually the biggest part of the job. It takes a couple of days a week. So you respond to every single person? Every sub- submission gets a reply, yes. Wow. Uh, uh, nowadays, of course, the responses are by email. So uh, it speeds up the process in that direction. Um, when I accept a puzzle, I slot it for a particular day of the week. Sunday is obvious, but on the day, weekday puzzles, it depends on the level of difficulty. You know, Monday is the easiest puzzle of the week, and it builds up to very hard on Friday and Saturday. And then when it's time to edit, I, week, I edit a week's worth of puzzles at a time. I pull out a puzzle for each day of the week, usually from the oldest, uh, they tend to be the oldest puzzles in my inventory. And uh, I'm a very hands-on editor. On average, half the clues in the Times crossword are mine. And I'm editing partly for accuracy. doesn't matter how clever or interesting or current and funny or anything else the puzzles are. The clues have to be right. So everything gets checked for accuracy. And then I edit for 
the correct level of difficulty as I envision it. And then I'm editing for freshness, humor. Uh, the harder puzzles should have twists in the clues, clues that mislead you, but uh, turn out to have surprising but correct answers. You know, all the things that make a puzzle fun to do. That's how I'm editing. Can you talk to me a little bit more about the difficulty aspect of it, though? Because I find all of the puzzles to be difficult. Sunday <laughs> is Sunday is damn near impossible. But, like, they all have a level of difficulty. And how do you balance that? Well, a number of answers to that. I am a solver myself, obviously. I haven't solved the puzzle, but I can tell how hard it's going to be just by looking at it. Every puzzle, I think, has a natural level of difficulty. So I want to edit the clues to meet that difficulty. Sometimes people will send me you know, a puzzle with a simple theme and then write difficult, obscure, tricky clues. And, you know, that's just not right. I have to edit all the clues to make them easy to b- match the puzzle. And uh, and then there'll be people who will do uh, a puzzle that's naturally hard because it has some hard vocabulary or a tricky theme, but the clues are easy. So I have to edit all those too. So uh, once I edit and typeset the puzzles, they go out to four test solvers one of whom rechecks every word and fact after me for accuracy. Hmm. And all the solvers call in with their comments and corrections, things they liked, they didn't like, found hard or too easy, whatever. I polish the puzzles, send them electronically to the Times, where a former national crossword champion and a friend of mine goes in and uh, tests the puzzles again. (laughs) And she also prepares them in all the different formats that the Times Crossword now appears in. You know, when I started, it was just print, but now it's uh, many different electronic versions that the puzzles appear in. And uh, that used to be the end of the process. But uh, years ago, the, well, there was this crossword forum where this, <laughs> where this uh, uh, solver named Martin Herbach wrote these little nitpicky comments about the clues, things he didn't think were quite right. And unfortunately, he was sometime, he was often right. And so I decided, why should I wait till the puzzle's in print to get his nitpicky comments? I'd rather have them <laughs> before the puzzle appears so I'd have a chance to change it. So after Ellen, this my friend at the Times, finishes her work, she sends Martin PDFs of the puzzles. He solves them literally in the next couple of hours. And uh, our understanding is that if I don't hear from him, Everything is fine, but uh, <laughs> if he sees something that he doesn't like, he doesn't think is right, he lets me know. So this guy got, problem. like, special priority puzzle access <laughs> by starting <laughs> up a forum of nitpicking all of these puzzles. That's right. I like this elite team of four people, like the four solvers that get to see the puzzle beforehand. <laughs> what tip would you give me for getting better at puzzles? Yeah, I get asked that a lot. Well, yeah. number one, the easiest clues tend to be the ones with fill in the blanks. Okay. So if you see a clue with a blank, uh, try that. It's easy to spot in a list of clues. They often Clues like that often have unique answers. But whatever it is, look through the clues, find something you know for sure, fill that in, and work from the crossings. And the unusual letters of the alphabet will be more helpful than... You know, the vowels like E's or an S or a T is not so helpful. But if you've got a an X or a W, that's going to suggest something in your mind. Work from what, just like everything in life, work from what you know for sure and build out from there. If you get stuck, put the puzzle aside, come back later. It's amazing how often that trick works. You get one new answer next time, and then you're off and running again. So oh, another thing I'm kind of wondering is you mentioned you get that question all the time. When you're at parties, like, are are people always like, Will, tell me a puzzle? Or like, like I assume if you're a comedian, people are always asking you to tell you a joke. Are people right. always asking you to tell them puzzles? Oh, they don't have to. I will do it on my own. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, you are like unprompted. People are like, you're Will Shorts, and you're like, yep, here's a puzzle for you. And then you just l- walk away and let them like mill on that for a bit. Well, no, I will. Uh, uh-huh. I'll, uh, I like puzzles there. I will be there with the person um, and they can ask questions to get the answer. Um, I can turn anything into it. You know, uh, if you have 
a minister or a religious official to your house for dinner, you know, they're going to say grace uh, before the meal. So if you ask me to your house for dinner, <laughs> you're probably expecting a puzzle. And uh, I just... Uh, I like to give puzzles. I like to twist people's minds. And I can turn I can turn things into puzzles. It doesn't even have to be – I don't even have to plan it. I'll just turn something into a puzzle, into a game. Just, so you uh, can impromptu puzzles. I'll do impromptu puzzles all the time. I love what? to do that. Yeah, okay. Let, can, you give, can you give me an impromptu puzzle? <laughs> um, say that off the top of my head, no. But uh, there will be a situation where – uh, and something unusual comes up, like I think, oh, I, I was thinking about, oh, I ran into an interesting person yesterday. Well, rather than telling you who that interesting person was, I'll say, I met somebody yesterday that you like a lot. Can you figure out who it is? And you have to ask me yes or no <laughs> questions until you nar- narrow it down. So the first editor, Margaret Fair, said, I don't think I have to sell you on the increased demand for this type of pastime in an increasingly worried world. You can't right. think of your troubles while solving a crossword. That's right. She always said that you uh, you can't worry about where the rent money is coming from <laughs> if uh, you're solving a crossword. So crosswords are, should be diverting. And so do you see a parallel between that call for the crossword 75 years ago and its importance today? I do. Um, so I want the crossword to be entertaining. I want it to be relevant to life. I want I want the puzzle to reflect what's going on in the world, but uh, not emphasize the harsher aspects. Something odd when uh, when uh, President Trump was first elected and he was naming his cabinet, and I had Betsy in a grid, so I clued it as education secretary or forthcoming education secretary, uh, DeVos. And there was some serious pushback on that. People uh, who were not fans of Donald Trump or his cabinet and Betsy DeVos in particular did not want to be reminded that she would be secretary of education. So on the one hand, I want the crossword to reflect life and, you know, for good or ill, there are things uh, about uh, the current administration that are not going to be popular that are going to appear in the puzzle. But uh, I try not to have too much of that because uh, I don't want to make people angry. That's that's really interesting if like thinking about the puzzle as a distraction when it first sort of started and then you trying to balance the more modern thought of like let's make the puzzle relevant. Right. But then you sort of potentially lose out on the ability to be a distraction by inserting all of these modern references in it. Yeah. Yeah. Another early, uh, shortly after Trump was elected, I had Eric, E-R-I-C, in a grid. So I included his, uh, you know, Donald Trump's son. son. So after, with Betsy and Eric in, in, uh, within a week of each other, because I wanted to be current, there were <laughs> people think, you know, what are you? Are you a Trump supporter? Um <laughs> So, <laughs> just, just because you inserted two words, two people's names into it? <laughs> there will still be Trump references, and uh, honestly, I'm not a Trump fan. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I think Trump voters deserve a say in the puzzle, too. Maybe <laughs> just not too often. I love I love like how rabid the fan base of the puzzles are. Like, you just... You put two names in it over the course of two weeks, and people are like, "What the fuck, Will? Like, what is this about? I Why'd know, you do this? <laughs> like, how could you do this to I us?" I know. I just clued Sarah a couple of recently as uh, you know, press secretary Huckabee Sanders, and people wrote wrote in, uh, "I do not want to be reminded <laughs> of that woman." <laughs> So I think like the the New York Times crossword puzzle at this point has become renowned. Like it is like one of the biggest sort of crosswords that I know, biggest in popular culture. You yourself have become very, you know, elevated in pop culture. Um, Like why do you think the crossword of all the types of puzzle games has become so popular? Yeah, I think the crossword is the best puzzle format ever invented. 
uh, and it's for because it's such a flexible form. First of all, it uses it's based on language, which we all use, so there's nothing esoteric about it. Um, it can be made big or small. You know, a Sunday crossword can take you a long time to do, but the New York Times now publishes a mini puzzle, five by five squares, takes you about a minute, which is just great for modern life. We the world is very fast paced now. Maybe you love puzzles, but maybe you have only 60 seconds a day to do one. So uh, it's very flexible in size. You can make it easy, medium, or hard. It can be general or on a specific topic. It's just very flexible. Um, and I think part of the reason crosswords are popular is the black, the uh, black and white squares. First of all, they just naturally they just look nice on the page. I don't know. Huh. Aren't they? Aren't, aren't crossword grids attractive? Yeah. And I think I think as human beings, we like to fill empty spaces. I think about this a lot. You know, if there is something that's unfilled, humans like to fill it. And if you have an empty crossword grid, you are naturally drawn to filling in the, the spaces. And when you fill in when you fill in the last square of a crossword, it gives you a tremendous feeling of satisfaction. That's something we don't. That's a satisfaction we don't get often in life. I, well, I I have never got that satisfaction. <laughs> you have, don't have that <laughs> you're satisfaction. Talking, you're no? talking to me about something I have no idea about. <laughs> I'm no, sure that's... it sounds nice to me. It's like the each one that remains blank is even more frustrating. It's taunting you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly how it feels. Like like I come back to it, I still don't know. I get an extra letter, I still don't know, and then I just give up. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I do try to have puzzles for all <laughs> levels of solvers, you know, so I don't know if you try Monday. You I'll know? try Monday. I got to get try back. Monday. I tried too many Sundays and it burned me. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Start on Monday. Start on and Monday. See if you can get that. Work and then my work, way up. <laughs> see how far through the week you can go. Um, one thing I want to ask, too, is like as print is starting to go away. People are consuming more media, news, games, things like that digitally. Do you right. think the crossword is going to survive this sort of digital evolution? Yes, and I have two answers to that. First of all, I think the crossword is ideally suited for print medium, and it was invented for that. Hmm. And uh, there is a tactile pleasure of filling in squares with a pencil or pen that isn't quite the same as clicking on a keyboard. There's just something nice about dragging a pencil or pen across paper that isn't quite the same um, typing. Yeah. That being said, the crossword is, is doing just fine electronically. The uh, New York Times crossword is available digitally now. More than 350,000 people have subscribed. Even if you subscribe to the if you subscribe to the print edition of the paper, you still have to pay extra to get it digitally. And mm. even if you subscribe to the digital version, digital edition of the New York Times, you have to pay extra for the crossword. Um, and oh. the basic cost the basic cost is thirty nine ninety five a year. Um, some people get discounts, but over three hundred fifty thousand people have subscribed, and it's a, an enormous profit center for the paper. If you read the the uh, quarterly report that the Times company puts out, starting in the last couple of years, there's a paragraph toward the end about the puzzle section and how much revenue that's generating. And that's something that brings me tremendous satisfaction and pleasure knowing that what I do for the paper is helping support the journalism that the Times does otherwise. Huh, that's that's so interesting to see it move from to actually be this like line item in the paper. Like right. line item in terms of like the accounting and like actually see the contribution that the puzzle is making on its own. Right. One of the things that I'm sort of curious about is you've been the you're the fourth editor of the New York Times crossword puzzle. You've been at it for quite some time. What do you hope the fifth editor of the New York Times crossword brings to the table? Interesting. Well, I hope to be around a long time. We'll okay. see. Uh, I, the, the Times has a reputation of attracting smart, qualified people. So I'm sure whoever follows me will, will be of that stripe. Um, 
I have an, uh, my assistant, Joel Falliano, is extremely talented. He, he uh, started with me about, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. He was a college student at Pomona in California and sent me a letter that said he'd like to be my intern in the summer. Hmm. So uh, uh, he was my intern that summer. It was great. Most of my interns I had had worked for just one summer and went on to something else. But at the end of the summer, he asked to come back a second year, and he was so good that I said, okay, we'll make it two summers. And at the end of the second summer, really, that was it. I'd never had anyone more than two summers, and he said he wanted to come back for a third summer. <laughs> so I thought he was so talented and so helpful by then. I thought, okay, yeah, let's do three summers. That'll be great. And uh, the next, uh, he went back to school, and then I assumed he would be going on to some full-time job. But uh, he said, uh, at the end of the third summer, I said, you know, I asked him, well, what are you going to do when you graduate from college? And after giving him saying a few different things he might do, he said, what I'd really like to do is work for work with you in the crossword. So uh, he's been with me ever since. Uh, he's not only my assistant, but he's also the Times' digital crossword editor. So he's the one who makes the 5 by 5 daily puzzle in the paper hmm. and also oversees the digital puzzle content. Um, you know, so he's my natural successor. Uh, he's extremely talented. And uh, so the crossword is in good hands. So just just to finish, elation, body part, what is the answer to this? I, I got nothing. I'm looking at my <laughs> producer if he figured it out. He has nothing. We're <laughs> what is the answer to that question? The anagram of elation is toenail. Such an interesting word, you know. You don't uh, so the the way the vowels uh, work out there. You you don't expect toenail. Great little teaser. Almost no one can solve it. That's a that's a great one. I had nothing. I wasn't even close. Uh, it, I don't think. Obviously, I I'm not at your level on puzzle solving. <laughs> I I gotta step my game up to Monday and see if <laughs> I can just do that. <laughs> Yeah, you can do it. <laughs> thank you. Well, I just want to say, like, thank you so much for being on the podcast. This has been an enormous amount of fun. Uh, it was really cool to learn not only about the history of puzzles, but, like, what it's like to create them, what it's like to be obsessed with puzzles. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you, too. Thanks a lot. Did you catch it? Toenail. That's right. It was great talking with Will. If you're a fan of weird work, you can find some behind-the-tape show extras on our Facebook and Twitter, at Weird Work. And be sure to subscribe to the show in iTunes or on Spotify or wherever the hell you're getting your podcast these days. There's really so many places. Too many places. Either way, no matter what it's called, we're on it. As always, I'm your host, Sam Balter. And stay weird, you golden ponies. <laughs>